William Berg has written seven books and approximately 100 articles about Sacramento history. One such book called Wicked Sacramento is about Sacramento's long gone West End neighborhood and the topic of tonight's talk. He holds a Master of Arts in Public History from Sacramento State University, serves as president of Preservation Sacramento's Board of Directors, and works as a historian for the state of California. Please give a warm welcome to our guest, William Berg. Thank you, and uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, most of the material that you'll hear tonight is from two of my books, Sacramento Renaissance and Wicked Sacramento, and they both revolve around the neighborhood that uh, is almost the missing hole in the donut of downtown Sacramento, an area where there are almost no buildings older than 1950 that was called the West End and was largely dropped from Sacramento's lexicon in the last half of the 20th century. But people are starting to talk about it again. And so people ask, where was it? And the, the, the basic five questions of journalism, who, what, where, when, and why. And uh, the first what was the West End uh, is a page left intentionally blank because when I started looking into this subject uh, just about 20 years ago, uh, there was very little written about it. Even the name had almost been erased. There were older Sacramentans who knew about it, but not a lot of people talking about it. And it wasn't something that you'd find on any maps. So we'll start with that question of geography. Where was the West End? And this uh, aerial view of Sacramento from around 1870, 1880 answers that question visually between the Sacramento River and the California State Capitol at 10th Street, the, the one built in uh, 1869, and then north and south bounded by two sloughs originally. Uh, to the north is Sutter Lake or China Slough, and to the south was the slough that is now the pond at Southside Park that became boundaries because of railroads that were also levees. To the south, the Sacramento Valley Railroad, the first railroad in California that uh, ran up R Street, still where light rail runs today, and then to on the north, the Central Pacific Railroad, a uh, product of the 1860s, which still functions as a railroad today. But otherwise, there's not a whole lot of recognizable geography in this view. You can see a few uh, notable places. I will see if I can show you with, a, with the mouse. Uh, here at 6th and M Street is the hall, Grand Hall of the California State Fair, or the, agri the Agricultural Fair as, as it was known. And then, of course, the state capitol and along the waterfront, you have railroads and a growing number of industries. And the neighborhood of the West End, as you can see, is this, uh, this bunch of houses here. They're south of K Street which already has a streetcar line and a horse drawn at their mule drawn at this time and a growing number of businesses and larger buildings. And then along our street, like you mentioned, the Sacramento Valley Railroad. And because that was a levy, it was for the most part, the Southern limit of Sacramento's development, even though the city limits went to Y street, what's now Broadway. So the question is, uh, when did this happen? And I mentioned 1869, the year of the construction of the state capitol as kind of a watershed because it marked the point where the city of Sacramento, which was built initially along the Sacramento River, began to move eastward in a serious way. And both government and commercial and wealth was starting to move away from the river. Now, there was some safety from water because of the levees on either end, the levees along the river, and the raised downtown, as many of you are familiar with the Sacramento's raised streets and underground sidewalks along J and K Street, principally, all the way into about where the convention center is now. That really changed the geography, but people needed a place to live. And the area around what was then M Street and within a few blocks around it was the place where a lot of Sacramento's, uh, the, the gold rush generation who became successful, built more substantial homes, including three of the the, the big four lived there. Uh, you can see Leland Stanford, Mark Hopkins, and Collis Huntington. Huntington had more of an apartment. Hopkins had a very modest place with a garden. And Stanford is the only one who's who's of uh, the, the big four whose residence is still there. But the fifth member of the big four, uh, not Charlie Crocker, but his brother Edwin Bryant Crocker in the upper right-hand corner, he built his house there and also the museum for his art collection. And, of course, it's the only survivor out of the principles of the Southern Pacific because he died before he could move to 
San Francisco, but it became one. It's one of the the handful of nineteenth century buildings that's in this neighborhood that survived. Now, who was the West End? If we're talking about the West End. We're talking about the neighborhood that em the emerged from it, which, uh, as you'll note, uh, the name changed by the eighteen nineties. It was called the Tenderloin. And people will go, well, hey, San Francisco also has a tenderloin. Is it taken from that? Actually, they're both taken from the tenderloin in New York City. A lot of the European American migrants to California came from the Northeast, principally from New York City and, and New York and New England. And they brought with them uh, styles of building cities uh, a lot of the trees were came from arborists who were from the northeast and uh and also did to extent, some extent language uh, and so they they named it the tenderloin the both neighborhoods in san francisco and sacramento and ernesto galarza called it the lower part of town in his his book barrio boy which i recommend to any historian of sacramento and around the 1910 19 teens to 20s people started calling it the west end because of a group that we'll talk about a little later and over the later half of the 19th century to through the beginning of the 20th, the neighborhood began to transform as the wealthy people of Sacramento moved either in the case of the very wealthy people like the, the principles of the Central Pacific and Southern Pacific to San Francisco or like the, the growing middle class eastward into what is now the Alkali Flat and Mansion Flats and Boulevard Park and Poverty Ridge and then point, points east as the city expanded. Uh, the people who moved in were immigrants and migrants, uh, principally communities of color. Uh, a lot of initially Italians and and um, Portuguese, but in the West End, the area along the, the waterfront, there were communities of Chinese dating back to the Gold Rush, and African Americans also dating back to the Gold Rush. And within the, a few decades, uh, especially in the starting the, the 1880s and 1890s, a uh, Japanese community began to emerge along M Street. And then within, within a few years of the early part of the 20th century, uh, people from Mexico started moving to California, often because of, because of the revolution in Mexico. A lot of people were displaced and came to Sacramento. So even though Sacramento and California had been part of Mexico, and there were um, a few people of Mexican descent and, and uh, of Latino ancestry in the Sacramento area. It was a relatively small community until the early 20th century. And then another community that formed was almost exclusively male, which was Filipino migrant workers, because after the Philippines became an American possession after the Spanish American War, men were allowed to come to California to work, but women were not. So it became a, as initially an exclusively male community that later evolved on its own, but all were located along with small numbers of others, including uh, South Asians and uh, other communities of color, uh, other Asian communities, including, I think, a small Korean community, all within the space of about a square mile. And they lived their lives in parallel. The, there wasn't necessarily a particular section that was strictly Japanese or an area that was strictly Latino. They kind of blended into each other. And so while the, the communities didn't always intersect, they were neighbors. And why was the West End? Why is this place here? Uh, Partially why these communities were here is, is that for communities of color, there weren't formal segregation rules in Sacramento. It was informal or by, by force of tradition and, and by force of uh, these are the places that the, the white community is going to let communities of color live, which is principally along the waterfront. The waterfront was the location of these heavy industries, which as the, as the 19th century progressed, got heavier and louder and more polluting and less comfortable to be near. But they also needed a massive workforce. So one of the major purposes of the West End was providing thousands and thousands of workers to the Southern Pacific shops and the canneries and mills and other industries of the West End on both sides of the river. You can see a shot here from at least 1935 of the industrial West End. And then there were also recreational purposes. There were an enormous number of bars and pool halls and other sorts of entertainment that people didn't necessarily want in their neighborhood, but they wanted to spend their money there. This was the place to do it. In many ways, the West End became the place where uh, any use that was unacceptable to the middle class and the, the wealthy could be placed there. And that also became the, the mention of the, the tenderloin. And very often the, the 
tenderloin in New York, the tenderloin in San Francisco, were associated with sex work. So was the one here. And these were from the 1890s to the roughly the era of World War One were zones of legalized or tolerated prostitution. And so a, a combination of brothels, parlor houses, cribs and and dance halls where sex work was officially or unofficially tolerated. This had some social consequences, uh, it, as we'll see in talking about some of the social movements that came up later. Uh, but it was because there was a, a, an economic need to be filled and people looking for work. And so the bodies of the people in the West End were for sale, for labor and, and for recreation to be perfectly blunt about it. And uh, one of the large little known workforces in the West End were the thousands and thousands of migrant workers. And very often the, the way that if you hear about the people who lived in this area or lived in what's now old Sacramento, they are characterized uh, used essentially as vagrants. And that's how migrant workers were described as, oh, they're just passing through. They don't actually live anywhere. They're just workers or they're, they're, they're just, they're just vagrants. But very often these were people who were, who worked um, both in the, in the industries in Sacramento and on regional farms. They would hire out from massive hiring halls in Sacramento. I think something along the lines of a quarter of the Central Valley's agricultural labor hiring was done here. They'd go out and work on a farm somewhere in the valley, come back with their paychecks, and they would spend it at these sites of entertainment, as at these bars and nightclubs and burlesque halls and other uh, places, and quite frankly, also also with uh, the sex trade of the of the west end and this is how the economics of this area functioned it had a, a important economic use that was unacceptable to other parts of town and we can see parts of town moving farther east the uh, grand hall of the state fair which had previously been located at sixth was now on the other side of an expanded capitol park near 15th and end street and then the uh, the cathedral of the blessed sacrament at 11th so the city is moving farther east and expanding partially just because it's a growing city with a relatively small space to grow into. The flood control is not very good, uh, so the, the neighborhood is, is getting crowded with more and more people. During the early 20th century, there was a social movement that emerged from the Republican Party which uh, because of largely because of the big four was very influential in California originally as the the anti-slavery party and uh, and the the party uh, that was actually more pro-immigration the the reason why we have a, a large had this large Chinese workforce was because the Central Pacific needed workers to work on the railroad during the war and but but what emerged was called the progressive movement and it was also very strongly associated with the women's movement and women's rights women's suffrage in the early part of the 20th century. It was also associated with what was called uh, the, uh, the, the move, uh, pardon me. Settlement houses, uh, Jane Addams settlement house in Chicago is the best known, but nationwide, the part of the, the, the mission of women in the progressive movement was helping immigrants become American by teaching them how to how to be American by teaching English and American traditions, patriotism and other American values, but there became thresholds which couldn't be crossed and uh, there were there were people many of whom ended up living in the West End, who were considered to be too, too foreign to ever be American, but we're going to look at that as well. Uh, women were seen as a civilizing force in American culture, uh, more religious, more spiritual, more uh, the, the holders of, of moral rectitude for men who tend to do things like spend their paychecks on booze. Uh, of course, uh, prohibition was another big progressive plank. And they had a strong influence in Sacramento, but not only because of the, we had been a strong site of Republican power since the creation of the Republican Party, but also in response to leftist movements of the era. The progressives were not leftists. They were more along the lines of what we'd call the middle class liberals uh, in today's parlance, or the, uh, the left of that era were groups uh, like uh, the Communist Party and Socialist Party and labor movements, uh, strikers such as the, the on the upper left is an image from the Pullman strike here in Sacramento, where there was a massive 
uh, cl closing down of the Southern Pacific shops and, in fact, all railroad traffic in California by the American Railway U Union. The Industrial Workers of the World, which had multiple actions here in, and chapters here in Sacramento, including uh, the so-called Kelly's Army in 1913 at the site of what's uh, what used to be the... Uh, the China Slough that I showed earlier. And then the, later on, especially after the Russian Revolution, a dramatic uh, response of anti-communism in the first Red Scares in the 1920s and reactions to uh, Upton Sinclair's run for governor as the socialist in, in the 1930s. So the progressives were seen as a middle road where government regulation, um, Things like environmentalism and uh, and uh, other other sorts of regulation of pollution and industries, it seems as a way as to to rein in the excesses of capitalism without abandoning it entirely. And one of the major figures in Western progressivism was Hiram Johnson, a Sacramento native and the first Sacramento native, I think maybe the only Sacramento native who ever was governor of California, uh, son of Grove Johnson, a, a politician who's more associated with political corruption, which is another thing that the progressives were trying to eliminate, and uh, became a, a nationwide figure as, as women gained the right to vote in California. Sacramento became the first city in California, possibly in the United States, to elect a woman to a uh, high city office. On what was called the the commissioner, the board of commissioners, uh, Luella Johnston, and she was here. As I mentioned, women were seen as this moral guiding force to clean up corruption, to clean up the parts of the city that had become degraded and sinful. Uh, Hiram Johnson also was on the national stage. He became a senator after his term as governor and also ran as vice president on the Progressive Party's ticket. The Progressives were a split off of the Republican Party that didn't actually last very long, but the ideas of progressivism became inculcated in some in some cases to both the, the, the Democratic and Republican parties of the 19 teens and 20s. Uh, locally in Sacramento, as well as elsewhere, the, they had moral crusades. Again, the idea of the part of the progressives as, as a moralizing force. And they saw these contemporary dances often based on popular music, which was already by the, the turn of the 20th century, uh, based on, on African-American music, on ragtime and then on jazz. Uh, banning, for example, public dancing in, in Sacramento, any place that served liquor that resulted in a few interesting experiments and loopholes but a lot of those venues were uh, previous to that point in the West End. And part of the purpose of this was avoiding uh, having young white women fall into what was uh, euphemistically called white slavery, uh, sex work. And the idea is that these, the, even something that's interesting is going to an ice cream parlor and then to a dance hall would uh, trap women in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, the, the white slavery's clutches and, and uh, end up, as a, as, as a fallen woman and, and uh, while sex trafficking, again, these are real problems that need solving and need, need addressing because this, this did happen. But the way it was characterized is a little bit uh, troubling and that it's only, it's only assumed to be a problem uh, if the woman in question is white. Uh, why else would you call it white slavery? And of course, the dance hall was the next step from the ice cream parlor. And from there, the, the descent into uh, drug addiction and crime and death and disease, all of which were the, the social ills that the progressives were attempting to correct through one means or another. But part of it with uh, what their objective was is, is eliminating the, the physical signs of it. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 there were women of color also involved in the sex trade, they were not, for the most part, uh, the beneficiaries of concern about white slavery for obvious reasons. There were a few exceptions, just a handful. There were a few activists in Sacramento and San Francisco in, in helping uh, Chinese women escape the sex trade. Uh, but one other thing you'll note about these, uh, these mug shots is that the, none of these women were arrested for prostitution. Prostitution is their profession. It is their job. They were arrested for other things, charged for it, in some cases for uh, vagrancy, which is basically being in the wrong place. But sex work itself was something that the progressives were trying to stamp out, that, that it was the, the toleration of it that at least temporarily created a reprieve because a, a 
brothel or parlor house could, for example, call the police on an unruly patron and expect a response. And uh, the, the police would not close down the venue. They would uh, solve the, the problem. But the conditions uh, for women in these situations, like, uh, like thousands and thousands of workers in Sacramento and millions throughout the United States, were pretty rough. And the, the progressives, generally, unless you were white, weren't too concerned about that. Uh, one of the big national laws that was passed during during this era to prevent sex trafficking was the Mann Act, essentially the idea of taking women across state lines for immoral purposes. The first first person who was prosecuted for that was champion boxer Jack Johnson when he took his girlfriend on a, a trip to Washington, D.C. and ended up losing his title because of it. But the second prosecution was of two men from Sacramento, Drew Caminetti, who was the uh, son of Anthony Caminetti, an Italian immigrant who actually tightened up a lot of the United States uh, immigration laws in this, this era, and Maury Diggs, the son, uh, son of a, a state senator, uh, who took their girlfriends to, to Reno. Um, Another element that was involved in the progressive movement was the eugenics movement, generally the, the idea that you could breed better people and better in the, the eugenics movement view was generally whiter. And so there was uh, an element this was uh, treated as a science, but it really was a pseudo pseudoscience. There wasn't a whole lot. There wasn't scientific basis for this. And people didn't even know what DNA was. Uh, but Charles Gady. A uh, pretty well-known Sacramento was very involved in this. He also became he was involved in the Sacramento's first planning commission. And one of the people who um, was affected by this was a guy named Joe Fusky, who uh, would, became known as the king of the tenderloin in the 19 teens. Who was uh, sent? He was actually sent. Uh, he was an Italian immigrant sent back to Italy uh, after his crimes. Essentially, he was deported out of the United States uh, for for trafficking and was described in a rather difficult to read essay called scum from the melting pot and the assumption is that there are just people who are too foreign to ever be american and joe fusky an italian uh, immigrant was one of those people I'm not sure if people can hear the recording that's going on right now. We we don't hear the recording. Okay, sorry. I had a there's audio playing, but this is a photo of Grant Cross and William Snow, the only ones I have, one from the newspaper and one as a mugshot, and they were the founders of the West End Club, which was a men's social club for African-American men. The idea is it would just be a black equivalent of the Sutter Club, a social organization um but they they started they had a few different names they uh frederick douglas improvement society and later the eureka club but the west end club is the closest thing i can find to an origin of the name the west end for the neighborhood uh, another figure in the west end associated with the filipino community is this guy uh, nicholas makovich uh sacramento slavonian community uh, uh who were Eastern European immigrants were also part of the West Ends and uh, more in the, in the Southside Park area. But Matkovich had a, a business a hotel at 4th and L Street, which was called the Hotel St. Nicholas. And he had a workforce of Filipino men who he hired out as workers. Uh, so he was, uh, functioned as, as one of those hiring agents that I mentioned earlier, but he also had a hotel for them and also uh, dining and recreation on site. I'm not sure how the indoor golf worked, uh, but the, there's there's basement golf now, so maybe it's something like that. But um, the this Filipino workforce also had a what was called a taxi dance hall in it and that created a bit of a splash uh, and a huge controversy with the city because as i mentioned the women were not allowed to migrate from the philippines uh, like the men were so he actually hired white women to dance with the filipino men which really up upset the uh the the racial propriety instincts of the progressive leaders of sacramento and uh nicholas matkovich was not a civil rights advocate uh as far as you can tell he was he was a pretty brutal guy he uh really didn't care about women at all other than as, as being his employees but he was just really really stubborn 
And so he continued operating these, the, uh, not only that dance hall, but multiple other dance halls for years. And actually, there was a, a workers' rights case where, uh, because how, how it worked is that men would come in, they would buy a ticket for a dime. It's called, it's sometimes called a dime a dance hall. And they would uh, go into a room where there was a, a large number of women, the dancers, and you'd give, present a ticket to the dancer and you'd dance with them for one song. There's a band playing in Medley that changes about once every minute or so. And if you want to keep dancing, you provide more tickets. And then the dancer turns in the ticket and gets five cents. And they actually got four and a half cents in part because of the, uh, the, the excuse was, well, that's your, that's your unemployment insurance. And then when a woman uh, left the dance hall, she was denied unemployment because, oh, the Matkovich says, oh, she's an independent contractor. Uh, she ended up uh, fighting that and winning the case, but it took years. Another point about the Filipino community is they had uh, a, an influence on American fashion that was adopted principally by Latinos and also African-Americans in the 1940s. Uh, Filipino, the Filipino workers wanted to look good. And so they would buy American-made suits, which were often too large. This is typically, a Filipino worker is a larger, a smaller, shorter in stature than a European-American man. Uh, but they'd buy them anyhow and cut them to size, creating this baggy, blousey look that became very popular as uh, the zoot suit. And also, they uh, before the the Philippines were fully open to the United States, they would uh, end up uh, marry uh, across racial lines. There were miscegenation laws in California, which prohibited uh, marrying marriage between someone who was of European ancestry and not. But uh, spousal uh, marriages with uh, African Americans and uh, indigenous uh, women was actually pretty common during that era. Uh, the Japantown emerged, like I said, in the night in the 1890s, 1880s and 1890s. And generally, like other communities, they moved into older buildings that had been sold or abandoned by the, the, the wealthy European Americans that were moving to other parts of town. So to the left, we have the original location of Sacramento's Buddhist church. And to the right is a, a boarding house uh, for Hiroshima Ken for the basically for the idea is that it's for men who immigrated from Hiroshima in Japan and from from that that province and like other workers I mentioned the migrant work the migrant workforces were enormously important and so when Japanese first came to California they were here as as, as workers and over time the city changed in response to their presence uh People come as workers, they stay for a while, and they start settling down. They establish businesses, they establish families, families, they establish churches, like I mentioned, the Buddhist church. And it's typically that transition when they go from being the new workers who work for low wages and don't cause trouble to being the ones starting families and establishing communities and wanting to uh, do things like own property. That's when they go from being the, the, the great new immigrants to being the new yellow peril. And that's typically when whites started adopting legislation first against China, then against Japan and so on to limit immigration from those countries. But they ended up creating a Japantown. Here's the aerial view of the river after 1935, as you can see by the presence of the Tower Bridge. And that bridge connection, first the M Street Bridge, then the Tower Bridge, meant that the this neighborhood also became the principal entrance to the city for uh, auto traffic and also electric railroad tra traffic. Sacramento Northern Railway traveled through this neighborhood. And uh, as I mentioned, the Latino community started to grow in the 19 teens and continued growing through the 20th century, uh, established itself uh, with, uh, with uh, a church, uh, Our Lady of Olupe, which started out as the in the basement of an alkali flat church i think saint saint stephen's a school a uh, uh, catholic school so by the mid 20th century you've got this this very rich multicultural neighborhood that expresses its traditions uh, along with its neighbors and that is working like like other generations of immigrants and migrants to make a name for themselves, to establish as businesses, uh, to celebrate their culture, their traditions, their religions, uh, and, uh, and be part, uh, but while also becoming Americans. That again was the part of the, the, the progressive dream is teaching 
Americanism to these generations of new Americans. Uh, but Sacramento's business community called it blight. And blight is an imaginary disease of buildings that is caused when the people who own or occupy them are the wrong color. There's really no other definition that makes any sense because, for example, the building that you see in the background there, uh, that was built in 1951. Now, this is this photo was taken not long after that. And it's a building that was brand new and it didn't last a decade because it was blighted. Not because it was old, not because it was run down, but because it was a Japanese church. Uh, part of the establishing what was blighted and what was not was done uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, during the Great Depression, a lot of people were out of work. And the, one of the mis missions of Depression era programs was putting people to work. And so there was the, 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 the C, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which put construction workers and laborers to work. There was a federal art program that put uh, people to work who were artists or musicians or actors. And then uh, there was the, um, the Federal Housing Administration, which, pardon me, I'm getting in. But, uh, but, but they, uh, the idea was let's create a new program that will provide, provide government subsidized loans for Californians or for, for Americans. And they, they were out of work realtors because, hey, the, the real estate market in California was kind of lousy uh, after <laughs> during the Great Depression. So they had realtors create uh, a system of how to assess risk for these loans. And how did they do that? Uh, well, realtors already had a system. The realtors, since it, starting in Los Angeles, really here in California, since about 1906, had been struggling to, they, they'd been creating new neighborhoods with what were called racial exclusion covenants. And this was not considered formal segregation because the government wasn't doing it. It was a private contract between the developer and the purchaser and then the purchaser and subsequent purchasers that they would not sell the property to anybody who wasn't white. In many cases, uh, anybody who wasn't white and Protestant. So Catholics, Jews, uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox were not allowed to buy those properties. And uh, and but whiteness was the the main barrier there. And because the realtors had already had this established realty practice, they inculcated it into risk assessment and they created four different classifications for neighborhoods. If you had a, a neighborhood where they had racial covenants and was all white, then uh, that was green. That was the best category. If you had a neighborhood that was that was all white, not necessarily covenanted, but but really a, a white neighborhood that was blue and that was second best if there was a neighborhood that had uh, ethnic white population so again uh, italians portuguese slavonians greeks jews uh or and and some other uh, categories of, of european immigrants were not necessarily considered as white as other whites uh, english french german uh from northern or western europe and uh, they, that's typically what got you the yellow category, and then red was you know, well. If there's if there's non-white populations there, then we're not going to allow home loans, and that's what redlining was. And a lot of these redlining maps look very familiar because they they e even match uh, development intensities today. If you look at the city's general plan for zoning, where are the most intensive land uses and uh, the the new development is supposed to go, or generally the places where areas that were redlined. If people see or hear about the West End, this is typically the kind of image they see is the, the image of, of uh, a skid row uh, or a slum. And these images are taken from the area closest to the waterfront, which are really in the worst condition. There are thousands and thousands of workers there, like I said, uh, staying in hotels and boarding houses that were not always in the best of condition. And they uh, were not slums in the formal sense, but this is not what, what the area that the city decided to redevelop first. Uh, again, the description of blight is, is very much tied to race, even in these political cartoons. You can see it. Uh, I don't need to go into too much detail. There was a vote, uh, a public vote on whether or not the city would adopt bonds to acquire and redevelop the West End. Uh, it did not pass. So the city in the, in the, the 1954 ended up taking on an innovative new form of redevelopment funding called tax increment financing, where the city would issue bonds based on the future value of the land. The idea is that because these areas are redlined, the property value is very low. If it wasn't redlined, 
then the property value would go up enormously, especially if we develop new buildings there. So we're going to borrow against that future value uh, on the assumption that we can take it from the people who are there now, move them somewhere else, and uh, and build something new. And uh, one of the symbols for the, this neighborhood became uh, places like the Zanzibar. We're going to jump back a little bit, talking about the Zanzibar Cafe, which was previously a Japanese-owned pharmacy uh, during the period when the Japanese were imprisoned, Japanese Americans were imprisoned during the Second World War. This became an African-American-owned uh, bar and restaurant and nightclub called the Zanzibar. And it became a home away from home for soldiers, principally African-American soldiers working at McClellan Air Force Base, during the Second World War. It also became one of the most successful uh, music venues of its era. It was not a huge place. It was not a place where you'd go to see massive big bands play, but uh, the more intimate forms of jazz and, and the more contemporary forms of jazz in the 1940s, uh, bop jazz, for example. And it was also where both national acts would play and also local performers. The, the fellow with the saxophone and the glasses is actually a, um, he's a mortician who lives in Sacramento named Ted Thompson, who blew sax at the, um, the Zanzibar and other Sacramento venues in his spare time. And this is really what set things off for the Zanzibar is the fact that it became a multiracial club. Uh, previously, interracial dancing was verboten in Sacramento as in many other cities. And the Zanzibar club was a, of an era right following World War II. We just fought a war against racism. So shouldn't we start lightening up a little bit? And the, the, the young people of Sacramento decided that they were, they were going to have this interracial club. And the, the business people who ran it were all for it because that meant money, that meant attention, but also meant negative attention from the city. And so the first building they got demolished in the redevelopment era was right next door to the Zanzibar Club. This is another building with a multiracial story. This is a, a, the originally a, a located at 421 Capitol Avenue. And it had been built as the home of a vice president of the Sacramento Valley Railroad in the 1860s. And then later during the early part of the 20th, 20th century, it was the Churchill, which became one of the clubhouses of the West End Club. It, it became a, a point of contention because the Women's Christian Temperance Union complained about it. Uh, because it was also a polling place. A lot of polling places were in bars, but they did not like the fact that this uh, notorious joint, the, the Churchill, where the West End Club had their events, was a place where you'd go to vote. Uh, the problem is that it was the only place to vote in the West End. If that was closed down, then uh, people of color who could vote in the West End would have to go to white neighborhoods in order to vote, which is not the most comfortable thing. And it later became a Japanese boarding house, until the family that owned it uh, were, again, were, were in prison during the Second World War when it was purchased by an African-American woman named Benny Twig, who was a serial entrepreneur. And not only did she set up the, the, this rooming house, she also owned a, a beauty school and had a, a grocery store on the ground floor. She also had a record store. It was one of the first places in Sacramento that sold what were called then called race records, what was later known as rock and roll. And she also opened a taxi service, Twigs Taxi. And she did that because if you're a black, you had a hard time getting a taxi in Sacramento. And so she figured if we've got our own taxi service, then, uh, then our community can get a ride. Um, and it was about a block from the Zanzibar and of course it was wiped out by redevelopment. Um, a lot of the efforts of these communities, the, the, they did not just sit back and take it. The, these communities were not passively suffering and not, not able to respond. The black community advocated for its presence, for its role, and, and, and the fact that the, this community filled a need. In, and this is an article from a magazine called California, which was a, basically a black interest version of Sunset Magazine, talk about, talking about the black community in Sacramento or in California. And this, this, this issue in particular in Sacramento, talking about the businesses, the political figures, the social figures, and uh, other, other members of the community who were making a difference. Uh, the businesses they were starting, like George Dunlap. I mentioned Ted Thompson, the saxophone player. There he is on his right with his wife, uh, Mrs. Thompson. Uh, and I, sorry, I, they didn't mention her first. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Georgia Thompson. Uh, and their funeral home, which was in the West End. You can see they actually added to the building uh, an older 19th century building with a 20th century addition. Uh, and that was the, the way that these communities wanted to characterize themselves, is people of ambition and hard work making a success in a place that was 
not particularly welcome to them. They said, you know, we're going to we're going to turn this into a success. The the place that the wealthy had abandoned generations earlier they said, we're going to we're going to make our stand here. And that's the way that many African-American communities characterized their their place, uh, especially after the Second World War. And again, after this war to fight against prejudice and racism, and they came back to only to find prejudice and racism at home. Some of those folks were people like attorney, attorney Nathaniel Colley, who became a crusader for civil rights, especially in regards to fair housing, and had many successes in, in that endeavor through the course of the, the, the 20th century. Mentioned Our Lady of Guadalupe Church earlier. It was a third and O Street, and it was reputedly the carriage house for the Crockers, although it was across the street from the Crocker house. So I'm not so sure that that was the, 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 the role of it, but it was the location. And again, Sacramento's Latino community was asserting itself, saying, we're Americans. We've, we have now generations that are born and lived here, like gener other generations of immigrants. Uh, we're here to, to do business and, and be Amer as American as we can be. In the face of, again, the, the progressive era idea that there were people who were just too foreign to be Americans, even though if, if they lived here, they set up businesses, they raised families here. This was the counter tradition is uh, a new generation of Americans ready to take their place on the city and their neighborhood was this this West End, as we can see here in circa 1950. But Sacramento's business community had other ideas. Uh, this is a shot of the Chicago Columbian Exposition of 1894, and it was called the White City because it was made out of white plaster staff intended to look like marble. But uh, that metaphor of the White City also, the way it was interpreted in, in American city design, urban design, it set off a, a love of classical revival architecture. But again, the, this era of ascending racism, the early 20th century and of, of greater racial segregation. In the background, you can see what's called the Midway, where there were exhibits from other countries and showing kind of people from around the world. But the white city wasn't for them. The, the, that, was what the, that was what the Midway was for. And so Sacramento's West End resemb resembled the Midway, which was enormously popular. Uh, and things like that Ferris wheel in the background. It's the first Ferris wheel ever uh, at, at at the Chicago at this Chicago World's Fair. Showing off the world was popular to people because people wanted to be there. They wanted to spend the money there. They wanted to interact with this uh, amazingly complex and and exciting world. But um, but the people with the money wanted this uh, simpler, uh, whiter world and Sacramento was starting to run into some personality problems and from the, the 1880s to the early 1900s we'd gone from being the second biggest city on the west coast to being the third biggest after LA got bigger than us and then the fourth biggest uh, after after Oakland got bigger than us and then Seattle and Portland and we found ourselves in about 10th place and even the city of Berkeley tried to steal the it's the status of, of Sacramento as being the California state capital. So we started saying, well, how can we dress ourselves up a little bit? And we hired people like John Nolan, some other very reputable city planners of the early 20th century to tell us this is what should Sacramento be? What should we look like now? And uh, and John Nolan's idea was this uh, creating these these this grand grand boulevards into the city and diagonal boulevards for views of the capital from all directions that looked great from 10,000 feet. But of course, they would have meant demolishing large portions of the city as it was. This is a depression era plan, which again has created this essentially extended Capitol Park from the extensions, uh, the extension buildings built in the 1920s from the state capitol all the way to Second Street. But there's still the industrial waterfront. And what happened to the people who lived there? They don't know. There's no explanation. There, there wasn't money to do this anyhow during the Depression. But in the 1940s and 1950s, redevelopment went there, meant there was. And the initial versions of redevelopment from the 1940s were based around, we want to redevelop these neighborhoods that have been hit really hard by the Depression, and then hit again by World War II and the lack of ability to build new housing, resulting in a massive housing crisis as GIs come back and our cities are, are overflowing. Instead of building housing in the same place, um, nobody wanted to build housing for the people who were in these neighborhoods because they still would have been redlined. And it wasn't until 1954 and changes in federal redevelopment law, which created the opportunity for business communities. Sacramento became in many ways the first to the point where sometimes that the tax increment financing and relocating people is called the Sacramento model. 
um, was set up as a, as a way to completely reset a downtown by demolishing uh, pretty much all of it. And you can see here, there isn't even anything left. There's no old Sacramento in this, in this plan. The idea is everything on the waterfront was supposed to be gone. The only sign that anything of the neighborhood had been there was on the upper left, you can see a sign for what's called the International Bazaar, which was between um, I and J Street and 4th and 5th, there was going to be a trench which would dip down to the original street level and it would have a Chinese restaurant, a Japanese restaurant and Mexican restaurant. And that would be the only sign that these tens of thousands of people had lived in this neighborhood for more than half a century and built the city around them through their labor and through, with, the, with the strength of their bodies and their minds. Um, that ended up being pretty much what happened to downtown Sacramento for the most part. It was also horizontally zoned. The idea of Euclidean zoning is that people should live in one place and work in one place and recreate in another place and drive between them was starting to really take off in the early in the, the, the era after the Second World War in the 1950s. And you did that by segregating uses. You couldn't segregate people, but you could segregate uses and creating a new redevelopment plan along cap uh, to the west of the state capital and new state buildings that were going up in the in the early 1950s displacing uh the the west end starting not with the waterfront the what's now old sacramento for the most part that the labor market where those thousands of migrant workers work but starting with the african-american communities with the japantown with the chinatown then uh, 1964, Proposition 14 is passed, and 1963, the Rumford Fair Housing Act is passed. That essentially is uh, Senator State Senator Byron Rumford wrote, uh, first African American, one of the first African Americans in the leg legislature, said that uh, racial exclusion covenants, those are those are going to be illegal in California. It passed, it got signed, and then Proposition 14, uh, sponsored principally by the realty. Uh, agencies was intended to, well, no, no, we're, we're not going to enforce it. We're going to allow racial covenants, racial exclusion covenants. So until 1967, when race, when Proposition 14 was overturned by Nathaniel Colley and, and other Sacramento civil rights attorneys, uh, Sac California didn't get any redevelopment funds. So instead, the governor said, oh, we're going to do this capital area plan, and we're going to continue demolishing these neighborhoods to build an expanded state campus and displace about 5,000 more people. And so you can see no sign of the neighborhood that was there. Um, then, but the only thing you don't, you don't see here is freeways. Uh, but those had to come next because, again, the idea is you're supposed to take cars to get, to get everywhere. And all of these new developments, uh, which were principally racially covenanted, were out in the suburbs. So how do you get there? You have to drive. And how do you drive there? With a freeway. And freeways, Interstate 5 and 50 and Business 80, and one that was planned along the northern end of town, through, which would have gone through Boulevard Park, the Elvis distributor, but it was never built, were intended to wall off the central city and also conveniently demolish a few areas of the West End that hadn't been demolished by redevelopment. And the way that uh, people wrote about it then is that it was, it actually, it was considered a good thing that they were going to tear down the last little bits. But uh, I also want to spend a few minutes talking about the neighborhood uh, and, and showing off uh, some of the, the, the human side of it and the people side of it, a lot of which we see we can see because of the fellow on the right, Harold Oye, who is a pharmacist who had a place uh, first at 3rd and L and 4th, uh, I think 2nd and L and 3rd and L. Um, and he was a shutter bug and he took thousands and thousands of photos and a lot of the images that we have of the West End, especially Japantown, uh, we have because uh, he took these photos and his family saved them and they were used by the California um, the, the California Museum uh, for an uh, uh, exhibit called Kokoro, which is has a there's a portion of it's a permanent exhibit, a portion of, of it that's online, and just showing some of the, the faces of, of the West End and the faces of this neighborhood that was called Blighted. Um, and if you think pictures of cats on the internet is a new thing that people always were always taking pictures of cats like this one. And you can see here, there's there's uh, you know some kids, but there's also some of the those West End workers I talked about to the left. Color also is one of those things that makes it gives gives a, a photo a sense of immediacy and presence. And the color photos of the West End tell a very different story than the way that is described in terms of the condition of the buildings and the condition of the community and the people of the community. Uh, and and uh, these were these were communities of color, and, and you can see that 
in a in a, a color photo versus a black and white photo is the presence of a, a diverse neighborhood and uh, and a beautiful neighborhood you can see the the 19th century architecture combined with 20th century additions and uh, this is from 1954 so the same era that the area has been calling be, being called blighted and irredeemable and we're we're losing this neighborhood where is it going it, it didn't get lost and um the the the, the beauty of it shows up in these photographs. This is 4th Street. It's kind of a, a little homonymy line of cherry trees uh, just before the, the blossoms were about to fall and the neighborhood itself was about to fall. Uh, this is a, a photo of the Sumitomo Bank. And anytime you see a, a tile setter in a photo like this, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a, a tile. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll save that for another time. Here's a color photo of that church that is uh, at 4th and O Street, the Japanese Methodist Church, built in 1951, blighted within five years of its construction and demolished not long after that. Uh, here's a, a Spanish language uh, Methodist Church at 6th and P Street. The, the second Buddhist church after the original Buddhist church I showed you burned down was built in the 1920s. And next to it was the, the Kaikon, the social hall. And after, after imprisonment, uh, after after the Japanese American community returned, uh, this was it was used both to store people's goods and also for people to camp out. Something like two thousand people stayed here over the course of the the return from camps to Sacramento. Hotel Maine at Sixth and M Street, built in nineteen twenties, uh, was a Japanese American owned building uh, with uh, African American owned tailors prescriptions in the ground floor. Oy's Pharmacy in a later location that had previously been a bank after his family returned from the camps. Uh, 1950s were this era of, of material goods, and so people wanted modern appliances and you could purchase them in this neighborhood. Uh, one of the few signs that survives from this, this era, the Wakano Uro Chapsui sign, even though the, the Wakano Uro restaurant is gone, it's on 10th Street today, but this is its earlier location on uh, 5th and N Street, I believe. And another view of the same building, you can see forced to vacate, quick removal sale. Why? Because the neighborhood is going away. Within a decade of their turn from uh, from internment and imprisonment, uh, redevelopment's gonna gonna knock out the rest of the neighborhood. And this is uh, Yorosu Dry Goods, which also uh, relocated to south of Broadway off, off of Riverside until the 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 last descendant of the owner who's op uh, of the 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 shop passed away, but the sign is actually preserved. Organization called Sacramento Modern funded its uh, collection and uh, it's now part of the Center for Sacramento History's collection. And then next to it is A&J Liquors, the owners of the Zanzibar. Uh, after the club was closed down, they, they opened a liquor store in the West End. Uh, this is a uh, pharmacy owned by uh, Sunisaburo Miyakawa. Uh, it was for a while a Japanese hospital. Um, that uh, also had African American patients. You can still see uh, Dr. Ito, physician, and surgeon, sign above, above on the second floor window because uh, they weren't satisfied with their treatment of the county hospital. These don't look like a neighborhood in disrepair to me. Uh, the the buildings are occupied. They're clean and clear, the sidewalks are clean. Uh, this is a neighborhood that's that's starting to regenerate. And the kinds of buildings that you see are ones like this. This is a, a, a sixplex, the kind you still see all over Midtown, some of Sacramento's uh, central city neighborhoods. But it was considered um, obsolete housing because it was a multifamily residence. One of my favorite things about this is I found another photo of it with this uh, young gentleman uh, in, the, in the picture and also another photo of him with, with his girlfriend. Uh, a little more modern style of house in another part of the West End, also, I think, demolished for, for highway construction. And this building, this apartment building, actually still exists. It was really originally around 6th and O. It's currently on V Street and 14th today near William Land School. And it was relocated because it was a brand new apartment building. Again, brand new buildings. Oh, nope, it's blighted. It's got to go. And, and this was one of the handful of buildings that was moved rather than destroyed. Uh, this is the Flower Garden, built in 1951 as a soul food restaurant by Felix Flowers, an African-American entrepreneur and a member of the, the Elks. Uh, he, the Black Elks were not allowed to meet at the Elks building downtown, so he built this as an Elks Lodge for the local Elks, uh, African-American Elks community, as well as a restaurant. But it closed after about three or four years and was sold to Sacramento's Japanese-American Citizens League, where it became uh, the VFW chapter for Nisei soldiers who were not allowed to join the VFW. Uh, 
because it had a meeting space. It had a commercial restaurant. It's the perfect spot. And it's actually still there today. Preservation Sacramento did our, our quarterly round preservation roundtable, the first one we've done in person since 2020 uh, at the Nisei War Memorial. It's at 4th and O Street. I highly recommend stopping by because there's a really terrific and very um, moving sculpture and memorial of the, uh, the, the story of Japantown and imprisonment and uh, what happened afterwards out in front. Uh, there's one other building of Japantown built around 1951, the Nisei Barbershop. Upstairs is actually, it's, it's, it's a, it was built uh, by an attorney, um, Henry Takeda. And he was, uh, like Nathaniel Colley, advocating for housing uh, and also advocating for not demolishing Japantown. Again, these communities did not passively sit back and just have to take whatever is dealt out. They did fight, they organized, they they used multiple strategies to try not only to, to, to make their, their economic role and their importance to the community clear to Sacramento's leadership, uh, but they also took their, took their case to court and, the, and they lost. But there's only a couple buildings left. Uh, all, almost all of the rest was demolished. But the story didn't end there. Um, the, a lot of the, the dialogue, the, the narrative of what happens in a neighborhood like this is a narrative of decline. And, and when you got there, the, the neighborhood declined. It went downhill. The property values were sinking fast. And what a terrible thing to say. It's kind of like if someone comes up to you, you go to a party and someone's up to, coming up to you. Says, Everyone was having fun until you got here. Ah, what a bummer. Uh, and why part of why I named the, the one of the books I wrote about this Sacramento Renaissance, I, I wanted to talk about what happened afterwards. And the, the neighborhood that what happened wasn't a decline, but a rebirth, a, be, a, a beginning. There's also a not too subtle reference there to the, the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, because the what we saw in the 1940s and 1950s in Sacramento this expansion and explosion of African-American businesses in the West End alongside the returning Japanese Americans who are starting to build new prosperity, even in a city that absolutely wants them gone. Uh, that's a rebirth. That's a renaissance. That's a that's um, a, a black business district. That That is a success story that almost happened. Um, uh, but what happened is is people the people lost their place. And you can see here uh, in the center part, you can see the central business district and the labor market, Japantown, uh, Shallow Baptist Church just below it, and then above it and below it, uh, Alkali Flat in the Washington neighborhood and Southside Park, which were unrestricted neighborhoods. And the, the central city overall did not have racial exclusion covenants. Those were only located in neighborhoods that had built, built after about 1910. So parts of Oak Park, and Curtis Park were unrestricted and the central city. So when these areas uh, almost congruent with the West End, so the redevelopment area, Capitol Mall Project, K Street Mall Project, Capitol Area Plan are demolished, where do the 10,000 or so people go? The Latino community predominantly to the north, to Alkali Flat and also to Southside Park where they established the current Our Lady of Guadalupe. The Japanese and Chinese communities, principally south, into Southside Park and a little bit into Land Park, but Land Park is mostly segregated. So in some cases, if you're someone who has a, a white friend who's willing to be a straw buyer, buyer, they buy the property with the covenant and they sell it to you because they're their buddy and they're not a jerk uh, who's gonna insist on this covenant because it was very hard to sustain racial covenants legally. It was very hard to win a lawsuit to keep a racial covenant. You just had to be essentially gutsy enough to do it. Uh, and then the African American community moved both to north to past North Sacramento the area on Del Paso Heights, where there was already a small African American community on the western side of McClellan Air Force Base, where I mentioned the the, the uh, African American soldiers there. There was also a community there in a, a little place called Splinter City, which they called because it was uh, basically a neighborhood built during the war out of old air aircraft crates leftover lumber so that ingenuity uh built a community and it became a, a neighborhood of exodus and then to the south to uh to oak park and and many people today don't know 
where the where the original the, these original neighborhoods were that we had a Japantown that was downtown that we had an African American community that was downtown. Uh, they assumed that Oak Park was always the the black neighborhood, but it wasn't. And when uh, when the central city overall became uh, more of a neighborhood of color because the that those neighborhoods the what what had been the the posh neighborhoods of the late 19th and early 20th century became less appealing as the central city got more industrialized especially because there's all this darn traffic um the highways were put in which created physical barriers between the much more predominantly white and covenanted neighborhoods of east sacramento and Land Park and, and parts of Curtis Park and the Central City and Oak Park. And those barriers are still in place today. Uh, the legacy, what, what do we get for this? What do we get? What do we trade for a neighborhood? Uh, the plan worked. The whole uh, higher property values uh, by removing the redlining, by removing the people, it worked splendidly. Property values went up 75-fold. The problem was, of course, that the people who had been there saw none of it. They were bought out for pennies on the dollar because the property was worth less when they were sitting on it. And after they moved, they became the uh, uh, parking. As you can see here, many of these parking lots, some of them, are, a couple of them are still around. Most of them are, are now buildings. Um, and of course, I-5 is where the, the big parking lot in the, for, in the, the foreground is. And offices. Uh, but a tr precipitous loss of population. The central city went from 58,000 people in 1950 to 28,000 people in uh, 1970. Uh, that's through the entire central city. So that's redevelopment and the capital area plan and highways all told cost us 30,000 people and turned what had been this vibrant, energetic uh, nightlife district and business district and also densely populated neighborhood. And that's part that people still miss. Uh, became this very quiet, calm capital mall and very stately. Looks very pretty from the air. Looks okay from a car. Not so much the, a good pedestrian experience. And in, in many ways, you know, the, the, it's a big civic issue that people talk about in Sacramento is how to, how to fix capital mall. The thing is, uh, what they did worked for what they wanted, which is higher property values and removing uh, the, the blight of, of human beings who had, had been necessary, critical, indispensable to the development and growth of this city. But were no longer needed in the view of the business community and, and our and our city government. And now what's happening is the building in the background, and actually two of the buildings in the background uh, to, on the either side of the Capitol, are state build state office buildings that are being proposed for conversion to housing. And that's part of the story of how we get the West End back. What we also got one compromise uh, if that happened was in uh, the creation of Old Sacramento. And this is the the was a, a 1880s view, I believe, of the Sacramento waterfront. And then I talked my way up onto the roof of the Sacramento History Museum in 2008 to get this picture of the waterfront. And what we got uh, in old Sacramento is we managed to save a few buildings. Uh, some were recreated or reconstructed, and um, others were saved, surrounded by uh, Interstate 5 and Capitol Mall in a kind of a petting zoo of historic buildings. And there is some real history there. There is some real story there. Old Sacramento does have some, some truth to it, but the, the story that, we, that most people learned in Old Sacramento until very recently excluded a lot of the story and included, excluded a lot of the people of that story who again were essential to the building of this city. And we're, thankfully, they're, they're really starting to be included, and, and the, the folks at the Sacramento History Museum and in Old Sacramento are starting to make some changes in the way that they interpret the story. And I think it's, it's, it's been a success because the demographics of Sacramento, the demographics of California, and the fact of the United States are really now starting to resemble more what the West End was a century ago. This went from being a, a, a very, very white city with a small neighborhood of color to being uh, not only one of the most diverse, but the most integrated cities in the country, still with our issues, still with our, our segregation, especially on a regional scale, but a broader story to tell. And that story is getting told more loudly. And there's evidence of the West End. There has always been, as, as ever since it was lost, uh, groups like the Royal Chicano Air Force made their mark with murals, uh, like the one in Southside Park, on top of a 1935 
Art Deco mural or Art Deco bandstand, the Callahan bandstand by an Irish American architect is a mural that doesn't just cover the bandstand and it amplifies and enhances the zigzag modern design with Mesoamerican and Latino and uh, cultural designs from the Chicano muralism era. And then underneath Interstate 5, uh, there's Lazarium, which is another Royal Chicano Air Force installation, which secretly tells the story of California and Sacramento before Europeans arrived and of Sacramento afterwards, hidden in what was supposed to be completely non-representational art. And then alongside the, along the side of a parking structure, the most auto-centric, uh, mall-centric, don't live here, just drive here, spend money and get the heck home, uh, a mural of a beautiful butterfly, of a transformation, of that, that, that rebirth, again, the renaissance of these communities, not just in, in geography, but in culture, in music, in art, in expression. And it happened in other places too. While uh, the the area around Capitol Mall was wiped clean with no sign of its passing, uh, the Chinatown faced a little bit different fate. And that there were architects. So this is a the, the graduate thesis of a, a Sacramento native by the name of Suki Lee, who uh, is best known for uh, the, the 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 as being the designer of the Pancake Circus. He's big in Googie architecture, Googie art, Googie architecture. But he wanted to do a neighborhood, and if you were, we were going to redevelop Sacramento's Chinatown, it should be a, pl a place that is functional and useful for the community, with housing, with uh, community associations, and with architecture that reflected the culture. And what ended up happening both the, his design and other, other designs, it was, a, it was a team effort of local business people and the redevelopment agency now that they could no longer uh, avoid the fact that there were communities who lived here, again, communities of color who had a, a financial interest and stake and created a new Chinatown uh, centered around the uh, Confucius Church in the upper right-hand corner, which is the oldest building in 1959, and then a series of buildings built between around 1970 and 1972, principally by Chinese-American architects who are Sacramento natives, uh, and as, as businesses, as residences, as a mixed-use neighborhood that now has been around about half a century, it's starting to feel a little the worse for wear. And the concern with this is that people look at an older, older building and go, oh, you know, that's not really a historic building. We can get rid of that. But what would we lose by losing a neighborhood like this? Is it similar to the losses that this city took to its culture, to its, its built environment, uh, to its heritage of, of losing the West End? And, and the, one of the things that we can do uh, to recognize the loss of the West End is and to avoid making the same mistake. And so taking a closer look at mid-century architecture of this era and its expression by African-American architects, by James Dodd, uh, Sacramento's first black architect, by Suki Lee and other Chinese-American architects, by Japanese-American architects of this era, because this is Capitol Mall right now. Um, it's a, a neighborhood that could benefit from a little bit of West End, which means people and housing. Uh, sometimes there's official recognition that you can give for a place that's gone. This is the a plaque at 7th and G Street, the site of uh, St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal that is now a parking structure for Sacramento County. And a plaque is nice. It's a start. It says it's uh, the plaque program that the, Cal the state of California has is good for marking where something used to be that's important that you want to call out. And originally it was intended for things like uh, trails or battles or... Um, or uh, California missions were big and that many of the missions had not yet be, been reconstructed when the plaques were put there. But we can use these to talk about places that were lost. And there are a lot of communities in California and throughout the United States really that were displaced. Anywhere you look and you see a freeway that runs through a downtown or a mid-century uh, edifice in any American city, it's a pretty good bet that there's a community of color underneath. And one of those places uh, is right here. This is 4th and Capital, Japantown, which has been vacant for about 16 years uh, for a, a high rise that never happened. But what could you do with these big panels used to disguise the fact that there's nothing going on? Um, why not do super graphics? Those, those high resolution color photos they showed you, they can be blown up to the size uh, where they can be a poster for what used to be here to talk about the heritage of the West End, of the Japantown, of the communities that were here uh, that were displaced as a, as a way to show things off and, and continue that dialogue. You can also use more high tech approaches like a virtual uh, tour of 
the West End with a, an augmented reality app. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, you can get my books at superartmedia.square.site. And uh, we now have time for, uh, it's hopefully going to be a lot of questions. Thank you, William, uh, for such an illuminating talk. Uh, the chat was very active, so I know folks are really engaged, and we do have a lot of questions, so I want to pass it off to Melissa to ask those, um, but thank you so much for that talk. Yeah, thank you, William. Okay, so uh, first question we have is, did Japanese American individuals and families return to the West End after World War II incarceration? What was the overall impact of incarceration? Yes, they did. Uh, it, despite the fact that Sacramento Mayor Tom Monk and the city council put, published an official uh, a city decree that, that Sacramento didn't want them back. But most of the people who left came back. And what happened is just what I mentioned, they, they rebuilt. Uh, what do you do if your house is on fire? You grab the, and there's no time to, to, to pack up or anything. You've got to grab the things that are most precious to you immediately at hand and run out. And then what do you do afterwards? You rebuild. What do you do if your neighborhood is on fire? You do the same thing. You grab what you can that's most, most precious to you and you start again. And that's exactly what happened. Both the first time they were displaced during imprisonment during the, the Second World War and then after redevelopment when the same thing happened 10 years later. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, next question is, will you talk about flooding in the West End? Uh, flooding really wasn't an issue for during the period we're talk talking about. Both the levees that were set up in the 1850s and 1860s and the re relocation of the American River about a mile to the north using some of that, uh, again, some of that manual labor, so the, 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 the strong people. Uh, they moved the river and they pushed back the waters and they raised the streets. So it wasn't really an issue uh, during the period when we we're talking about when it was the West End. Great. Next question is, have people done oral histories or other interviews with people who remember some of these places? Uh, yes, the S Center for Sacramento History, uh, back in starting around the 80s, did a series of oral history interviews, especially uh, the, they did a, a whole uh, ethnic study with uh, people from the Latino community, and African American community. More was done uh, when the Kokoro exhibit was done with interviewing uh, Japanese Americans. There's still a whole, there's a whole lot that still needs to be done and a shrinking number of people who were there to see it that need to be interviewed. Uh, so if it's one of your relatives, get a recorder in front of their face and start asking questions. Um, but there have been some done. Uh, there actually, I, I'm not sure of the exact uh, locations to find it on, um, uh, archive.org, but the Center for Sacramento History has a lot of these recordings, and many of them are available uh, as transcripts and also to listen to. The recordings are available online. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, what was the Mr. Flowers restaurant called? The Flower Garden. And where did the people go? Um, as I mentioned, kind of towards the end, the, where the people went was uh, it depended on the community. And uh, what actually happened is what had been a very integrated community became more segregated as a result of redevelopment. So the African-American community went up uh, north to Del Paso Heights and south to Oak Park. Uh, the Latino community principally into Alkali Flat and then south into Southside. And then the Japanese and Chinese community mostly into Southside and also to a limited extent into to Land Park. Okay, and we have two questions about you. So someone would like to know um, what is your background and also where are you sitting right now? All right, uh, my background, uh, I'm, doing my, 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 uh, I'm not from Sacramento. I'm actually born in Chicago. Um, family is uh, Italian, German, and Irish in that order. And we moved to Sacramento when I was four because my dad got accepted to two grad schools, one in Oklahoma and, uh, and one in California at UC Davis. And he said, I'm I think I'll go to California. As to where I'm sitting, I'm actually sitting um, at home right now in, in my, my office. But the, the shot behind me is of the Espanol restaurant in East Sacramento, which, of course, started out in the West End. It was originally at 2nd and, and K Street and then later at 3rd and I Street, which is now it's, a, it's another Italian restaurant called Matone but I thought it'd be a suitable background for today's conversation. 
Great. We got some more questions rolling in. Um, so did the legal fight between the sex worker and the government with regards to independent contractors, unemployment insurance, did this lead to the creation of the Employment Development Department? I think the Employment Development Department was still around. The unemployment insurance was already a thing, and it was her trying to actually take advantage of her rights that spurred the lawsuit. But I, I still need to find out the, the details of the case. I still don't have her name, but that's a subject for a future book on labor. All right. And then did the term blight emerge from the real estate industry or from other sectors or a combination of many? It actually started out with the progressive movement and the eugenics movement. Uh, blight, uh, it was a, blight is a term that came originally from plants. It's a, it was a disease, disease of plants. And the assumption is that plants get blighted and that uh, people and populations got blighted through uh, what the what the eugenicists saw as poor breeding, and then its extensions to neighborhoods happened when the same people who had been involved in the eugenics movement got into the urban planning movement, and then deciding on things like where things should go in American cities. Great. Right, so I think we have time for about two or three more questions. Um, let's see. So someone is curious about the Native American populations in SAC, maybe re regarding the West End. That's a, a tough question. I don't have a whole lot of answers. And that uh, essentially, the, this is, you're talking about a population that was here up to the gold rush uh, that had just, pre previous to that. Uh, been almost nearly wiped out. Uh, something along the line, actually, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, the presentation you mentioned with Dr. Orona of none of her years. But what she told me is that, that, that uh, having a conversation about this is that uh, disease, when it came through California in the 1830s, wiped out close to 90% of the population. So most of the population had died. Uh, and there's this massive power vacuum, and that's what people like John Sutter stepped into. And then those who were there were were hunted. They were considered little more than vermin. And so uh, they what did they do? They ran uh, to survive. And so the population here during this era is very, very small of of the actual indigenous people of Sacramento. Um, so it's it's a it's an almost it's it, it's a hidden chapter. I don't know if we'll ever get the answers that we want. We have little bits and pieces. There's a couple pretty good books about the the, the history of indigenous people in the region, but there's there's hasn't really been enough research yet. Right. And then um, you mentioned that displaced people and shop owners got pennies on the dollar when forced to leave. Any idea how that would translate to dollars? Um, it's really tough to say. It, it depends individually on, on how much uh, individual properties were offered. In some cases, uh, folks like Henry Takeda and other attorneys would argue to get a larger payment than the redevelopment agency was offering, but often it was nothing. And uh, one factor is that up until the early 1950s, if you were considered an alien ineligible for citizenship, which basically meant uh, immigrants uh, from Japan or China, the Issei generation, the first of the, of, in, of the, the Japanese Americans, the first one to arrive, you couldn't own land in California. So many of the people we're talking about weren't able to own the land the, where they lived. And so they were displaced without any consideration. And then those thousands of migrant workers got nothing. There was no re, there wasn't even relocation assistance except for families, which was a, a relatively small proportion of the, the population compared to compared to the the migrant workers. Great. So I think we have one more question. Um, and that is, was there organized opposition to this or just atomized opposition to this massive wiping out of neighborhoods? It was definitely organized opposition and partially from the positive end, trying to show what this is what we're doing. This is what this community is capable of, but also legal opposition. I mentioned Henry Takeda. I mentioned Nathaniel Colley. They're not the only attorneys involved, but their pleas mostly fell on deaf ears. There were a handful of people. Uh, Clarence Azevedo, who was a, a Sacramento mayor who had been on the redevelopment agency. He owned a business in Oak Park and he was a, a native Southsider. 
and he saw what was happen going to happen with I five as well. He actually ended up resigning from the redevelopment agency in protest of their decision to move forward without consideration of the neighborhood. But essentially, the, all all that happened is that he he walked out of he walked out of the job, and they proceeded without him. So that it was it was a fight. And there were serious efforts made to prevent this from happening, but uh, the the forces against them were just just too strong. Oh, thank you so much. I will come on and ask a quick question, William. I don't know if this was asked yet, but you shared some pictures of the vacant lot. Are there any plans? Um, I know you had some recommendations of what we could do with that space, but the it's on, I think, 301 Capitol Mall is the address, what used to be the heart of Japantown. Right. The, so far as I know, it's it's still vacant. If, if anybody has uh, $16 million uh, in their couch cushions, <laughs> they can buy it. Uh, the, 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 it's it's currently owned by, by CalPERS. And I think after a couple of failed attempts, they're really cautious about what they're going to put there. But the value of the land is extremely high because it's, it, it's a spot that allows unlimited height and unlimited density. And so it has a very large development potential. And so anybody who's going to buy it has to have a pocketbook deep enough to build something to justify the the underlying land cost and of course the effort to do it there's also a group um, uh, actually of the local advocates that start out just as a facebook group that talk about, about uh, reclaiming japantown and there is precedent for uh communities that lost property via eminent domain even generations ago of uh, being able to reclaim it and so one of the things they're looking at is a potential plan is, is there a way to take that property back as a form of reparation and turned it into a cultural hub of some sort and uh it's again it's it's an ambitious plan but it's uh, it, it's the 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 currents are are flowing their way i think and i i think people are at least interested in it, or at least discussing it and if there's going to be something there there really ought to be some kind of representation for for what was lost including oh. housing which is yeah. the other the other lost thing? Some people think of the West End, uh, if they know about it at all, as oh, it was the it was the nightclub district, right? So the arena is the West End now. So that's it's great. It's 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 it's, a, it's where everybody goes to party, like they did in the West End. So the, the most important purpose of the West End was a place to live. It was a neighborhood. People lived there, and that's something we're starting to do. We're starting to build back housing and things, do things like convert those state buildings back into housing the way that the um, that. Uh, Japanese immigrants turned old uh, mansions into boarding houses, but uh, but it's just the it's just the beginning of bringing back the thirty thousand people that we lost to downtown Sacramento. Wow, thank you. I know your talk. I after hearing your talk, I'm not gonna be able to walk around and like not imagine what it once was, and just like wish that I could see what it could have become. Um, and the work that you do is helping people like me and everyone else see that so thank you so much for you know sharing uh the story of west end um the work that you've been working on and uh wicked sacramento um can you share the link again uh, i can also share it in the message um to people after the event so that they know where they can get your book it's also there's a circulating copy in our collection as well um yeah. superartmedia.square.site oh, okay superartmedia.square.site. Thank you, uh, Melissa. And there's just one more question, which is actually a really great one. So hopefully um, we can get to it. How do you decompress from learning all of this? Oh, I don't know. I get pretty wound up. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but it's but part of it is 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 like I said that I think that we really are seeing the the narrative start to change, and so that is absolutely inspiring. Some of the things that we're seeing downtown, some of the things we're seeing throughout the city, and and kind of this this rise of awareness of where these places were, and uh, it's, it, it initially it's kind of that, that it is that shock of recognition and walking around realizing that what was there. But then the the next question is what's the potential for for what's next. Um, and how do we how do we, and how do we avoid repeating that same mistake? And having that foreknowledge is 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 far better than ignorance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sacramento certainly wasn't the first or only city that has been erased, um, as we've seen time and time again. But um, uh, thank you again for your talk, and everybody, uh, thank you for attending and for staying late with us or um, staying until 5.30. And uh, we hope to see you at our next event in, on December 6th. Um, and we'll send you out uh, the recording when it's up and ready for you to rewatch it, because I know I'll rewatch it. <laughs> but All thank right. you, William. This was really great.